The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. You can earn continuing education credits through ACI's online CEU program. Visit www.concrete.org to register. ACI conventions provide an opportunity for networking and for keeping up to date with the latest in concrete technology and practices. Uh, okay, we're going to have a first speaker, Sarah Witt, uh, who is a senior project engineer at FYFE Company, LLC, San Diego. She received her master's degree in civil engineering at the University of Colorado. She's been working with FYFE Company since 2000, and she's a very actively uh, involved in ACI committee for 40. Uh, with that, we'd like to have uh, for a speaker, Sarah. Thank you very much. Thank you to everyone for coming to uh, my talk today on the post-earthquake repair of circular reinforced concrete columns. First off, I would like to acknowledge my co-author, Dr. Rudy Saracino from North Carolina State University. He unfortunately was not able to be here today, and I was hoping he would to answer all the hard questions, so you'll have to save those for later. So what are we all here for today, this afternoon, to talk about? We're here to talk about what happens after an earthquake. Many of our structures that are in service today were not designed with proper detailing to perform well during an earthquake event. For example, this bridge failed completely after the Kobe earthquake. Now, there's not much that we can do for this particular structure, but there are a lot of structures that after an earthquake get moderate damage that we can repair quickly and get the structure back into service. This is especially important for bridges when the emergency personnel needs to get to the critical areas quickly. I'm going to be talking about some research we've done using fiber up materials as a way to repair moderately damaged structures. For those of you who don't know what fiber up or FRP materials are, they're a combination of high strength fibers and a polymer matrix material. The two main types of fibers that are used today are glass fibers or carbon fibers. And on site, they're saturated with epoxy and bonded to whatever they're trying to strengthen. From a design perspective, they act as a tension member. So when I talk a little bit about the design later, you can just think of the fact they add tension to the existing columns. Using FRP to retrofit bridge columns actually started over 20 years ago. It's actually one of the first uses for FRP in this civil application. This is an example of some research that was done at UCSD under the gut guidance of Caltrans. They wanted to look at how FRP would improve the performance of bridge columns if the FRP was installed on the column prior to an earthquake event. So this particular column was a standard column, and it was tested to failure. You can see here the, the load displacement curve, and it failed pretty much at a displacement ductility of one. So basically, as soon as the steel yielded, the column failed. So we took that column, and you can see the very typical shear crack here, and we wrapped it with a glass composite material. So keep in mind, this is a failed column that we're retrofitting with the FRP. And then we retested the column, and you can see the improvement in performance. That same column with a composite material on it now can achieve a displacement ductility of six. So it's examples of these type of tests that really prove that FRP can be used to retrofit bridge columns. And there's a huge industry today throughout the world to use these materials on actual bridges. 
But what we're more interested in is what happens after the earthquake. It's great if we're smart and we can get out there and retrofit all the bridge columns prior to the earthquake, but there's some that we're just not going to get to. And so the goal of our testing was to find up find a way to rapidly repair the columns using FRP systems. The column specimens that we used came out of another research program that was sponsored by Alaska DOT. That program was looking at the strain accumulation effects on the longitudinal steels under different load histories. Basically, it was looking at when the longitudinal steel buckled versus ruptured. So what we inherited were several columns that had been damaged under earthquake loading. It was perfect for what we were trying to do. The column specimens are two foot diameter, eight foot high. They have 16 number six longitudinal bars and number three spirals at a two inch pitch. We classified the damage of the columns that we tested into two categories. Moderately damaged was buckled reinforcing bars, and severely damaged was ruptured reinforcing bars. And we wanted to look at these two different cases because these often happened after an earthquake. Our philosophy behind the repair and the design was something that was a little novel. Fiber wrap materials have been used to enhance plastic hinge performance on columns, both round columns and square columns. But no one has really looked at the concept of trying to relocate the plastic hinge region. So our goal was to repair the damaged area, area of the column and, in effect, move up the plastic hinge region into the undamaged area of the column. To do this, we made use of a new technology called fiber anchors. Fiber anchors are routinely used on applications with fiber wrap strengthening on a small scale, generally about three-eighths of an inch diameter to six inches. So we took that existing technology and we decided to use it on a much larger scale. The anchors used in our test program were one inch diameter up to three feet long. The idea of using these anchors is to be able to provide a continuous tension force down the face of the column into the footing of the column. Now, this is something that there's very limited testing on because the FRP naturally lends itself to wrapping around the column and just stopping at the footing. So in this way, by anchoring into the footing, we provide a much better anchorage system in a continuous tension force. The, re the repair procedure was really quite simple. We took the damaged columns and we removed any loose concrete. If any of the longitudinal bars were sticking out from the face of the column, we just removed that part of the steel so that we could wrap the column flush. We did not add any additional steel. Then we patched the section and we wrapped it with the fiber wrap materials. These are the three columns that we tested. The first two columns, the one on the left and the center one, had buckle, buckled bars, and the last one on the right had, a fully, had fully ruptured bars. So as I mentioned before, the goal of our testing from a design perspective was try, trying to move the plastic hinge region of the column upward out of the damaged area. So our initial tests at the bottom two feet of the column here, we had vertical fibers to replace some of the capacity of the buckled bars, and then we put the anchors down into the footing. On top of that, we wrapped the carbon fiber around the column to provide additional confinement. Now, if our intention is to move the plastic hinge region up in the column, your effective column height now goes from here up. So to achieve the same displacement of the column, you actually have to have additional rotational capacity in this region here because the column is now effectively shorter. So our design goal on this first column was to add additional confinement here with the carbon fiber up to improve the performance of that new hinge region. So we went ahead and we tested the column. There is an axial load on top of the column. And 
we discovered that pretty soon after the testing began, we did start to see some hinging in this area. But what it turns out is we overstrengthened this area, and we ended up forcing the failure down into the footing. The footing became the weakest link. And so the final failure was rupture of those anchors into the footing. So we had to relook at our design. In effect, we proved ourselves our, our repair method was too good. Now, just I will show you um, a slide that compares all the results. But this repaired column performed better than the original column, so before any damage. So very effective repair, but we weren't happy with the failure mechanism. We didn't see the full hinging. So on this second column, also with buckled bars, we repeated the bottom two feet of the repair method. So once again, that's vertical fibers, the anchors into the footing, and then horizontal fibers on top of that. We retested this column, and you can see from the picture, we effectively moved the plastic hinge region up. And so this area here now acted as the new hinge. So as I mentioned, once you get this to act as a hinge, you now have a shorter effective height, and so you need to have it rotate more. And it did rotate more, so this undamaged area actually performed better than the undamaged hinge area on the column, the original column, which was intriguing behavior. And we think it's because the concrete that was confined here saw very little damage. So we managed to keep the damage just from this point upwards, whereas you, if you compared it to the unretrofit original column, there was a lot of damage in the footing area. So by wrapping this, we improved the overall performance. And so this saw a greater displacement than the original column. So then the last question was, can we repeat this performance in a column that has ruptured bars? So to take it one step further. So this column had ruptured bars. The ruptured bars were actually on one side of the column. The other side didn't have any ruptured bars. Same exact retrofit as this one. And we did originally see some hinging in the area. But in the area with the ruptured bars, there wasn't enough tension force, and it started to, to stress the footing once again. So on this column, we could sustain an additional force, but we didn't get the same displacement ductility because the anchors failed once again at the bottom. Okay, Those became the weak link in the retrofit method. Now, we were limited on this particular sample to the anchor size and number of anchors because of the steel detail in the footing. We didn't want to cut any of the steel when we put the anchors in, so we were limited. One of the things we want to look at for future testing is if we put more anchors in on a column with ruptured bars, if we can provide enough strength here to force that plastic hinge region there. So here's a summary of all the results together. This line here, this dotted line, is the original column. So then if you take that column that's now failed with buckled bars, and you were to just retest it with no retrofit method, this is its behavior here. Okay, So clearly it doesn't perform as well. It's a damaged column. So then our first retrofit method, where we had the horizontal fibers extending halfway up the column, is the green line here. So it performs better than the original column. But when we refined the design and allowed the plastic hinge region to form in the new intended location, we get this behavior. Again, better than the original column. And then the third column, the one with the ruptured bars that failed with the anchors, is this solid blue line. So you can see it had a greater force than the original column, but not the same uh, ductility. So just a couple pictures of the different failure modes. This is what you would see on the original columns. This is a picture of the anchors coming out of the footing. So the first and the third column saw some failures in those anchors. And then this is just above the repaired area 
on the middle column where we had plastic injury, uh, the plastic hinging. And it's a little hard to tell, but you can see back here the, col the concrete is all intact from this point down. Okay, so we feel we've proven that we have an effective method for repairing the columns after an earthquake. But as I mentioned, the second part of our goal is to see how quick we, we can do that repair. So along with the test program of the full-scale columns, we have material testing going on. And the goal of this material testing is to compare a couple different patching materials in epoxies that set much, much quicker than the traditional materials. And we can quantify their behavior so that going back, we can, we can provide a good design methodology comparing the quick materials with the materials we've already tested. We've also are looking at some different fabrics to see if perhaps an open weave may work as well if designed properly as the more traditional materials. This material testing consists of both actual material characterization and cylinder testing. We've done a lot of cylinder testing so that we can come up with a good confinement model that we can backtrack to the full scale testing. So in summary, we've demonstrated that it is possible to design and successfully repair severely damaged columns. But, of course, more research is required. We want to finish the material characterization, and we want to work on refining the anchor design so that with every retrofit, we can get that plastic hinge into the area we would like. Thank you all for your attention. Question. First one, how did you maintain the vertical load constant during the experimental work? And the second question is, how about the P delta effect? Did, did you consider that? Yes, we did consider it. I'm trying to. This is where Dr. Saraceno would be helpful. He knows more about the test setup. Um, you can see the load up here. It's a post-tension setup. And there's a jack up there, and it's post-tension down to the footing. And then the P-delta effect for how it behaves, do we consider that? Was that your question? But yeah, that's the question, because if, if you are doing post-tension, so the force is axial with the, with right. the post-tension. But in the reality, the P-delta effect, the, the, the load is vertical. So. Yes. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, our goal really on this testing was to try and get this curve, and that same effect is the same when we compare it to this because it's moving back and forth. So that's as far as we got with considering it. Okay, and how, how, how did you keep the vertical force or the axial force constant during that? Because when you are doing pushing and pulling, right, the yeah. vertical force is going to increase, and then the pull is going to decrease. So it's going to increase, it's going to decrease. We have to have constant vertical force. Right. How did you keep the vertical force constant? I'm going to ask Dr. Saraceno that, and I can get back to you. Okay. Because he designed the test setup. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I'd like to thank Sarah.